Regenerative medicines are treatments which aim to restore normal function for a patient. And that could be done by transplantation of tissues or cells or by the stimulation of our body's own endogenous abilities to repair itself. So it's often associated with old age but not necessarily. It could be associated with injury or a, a loss of some tissue. The idea actually is to produce a cure for the patient rather than just a treatment. Essentially it's the replacement or rejuvenation of tissues that are degenerating. Regenerative medicine is a fairly new field, but I think um, one of the best examples out there now is for age-related macular degeneration. And this affects uh, lots and lots of people. It is often um, uh, in old age where, where individuals begin to lose their sight. So there's efforts in the US, the UK, and Japan to generate retinal pigmented epithelium and then transplant that into the eye to prevent loss or uh, of sight. Parkinson's disease is an age-related neurodegenerative disorder that affects movement, but a lot of other aspects of a person's quality of life. We know uh, the, the particular type of neuron that's lost, and we know the location that it's lost. So our efforts at the moment are to generate that same type of neuron in, in the lab. If we can generate vast quantities of this type of neuron in the lab, then we can transplant it into the region of the brain where these patients are losing this particular type of neuron. So one of the major challenges is to make the cell type of interest in the lab. So we have these great models, embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, but these are not the, the cells you would transplant. You need to transform them into a, a cell of interest. So a diabetic uh, researcher would want to transform them into to insulin secreting beta cells. I want to transform my ESLs into dopamine producing neurons. So the implications for other diseases is, is very uh, big. So we have to fit uh, at least two criteria. So one of them is that uh, we need to know the exact cell type that's lost. The second big criteria is that we need to know that the location is accessible and it's, and it's fairly easy to, to um, transplant there. We will learn things from macular degeneration in the Parkinson's disease example, but it'll be, it'll be specific for diseases that, that fit those two criteria. Beyond the scientific challenges, there's a, a number of other hur hurdles that are in place to bring these uh, therapies online. It's always going to be the case that where there's a long, expensive regulatory system, you are going to need some commercial funding. Eventually, the big pharmaceutical companies will want to fund these therapies and distribute them internationally. But they're not yet clear how they could make money out of this kind of therapy. Venture capital companies are considering becoming involved, but again, there is too much uncertainty around the regulatory system, the ability to scale up the product for them to feel comfortable in investing large sums of money at the moment. So there is a big funding gap. Most of the funding models that people are looking at as potentially viable will include a large element of public funding or philanthropic funding. That raises the question whether we should actually proceed with investing a lot of money in these technologies. It's beginning to be appreciated that any major path-breaking disruptive technology like that almost always needs state support, both to help develop the product, but also to help create a market for the product. And it's always been the case that the early, very expensive treatments sound very off-putting but they become more affordable as time goes on and that's how medicine progresses. The challenge of producing stem cells for commercial use and indeed for clinical use as well is that our ability to control the stem cell is limited. Left to themselves, a stem cell will develop into cells of a particular type. It won't maintain in its stem cell state. Our ability to keep stem cells in that state is just the result of a lot of painstaking research. We can do that in the lab with small quantities of cells, uh, but actually moving to a much larger scale of manufacture is more challenging and much more difficult. Equally, if we want to produce cells that are fit for med medicinal use, then the regulator is going to demand that we have a robust process that works every time and that we understand all facets of it. It's undoubtedly the case that regenerative medicine in its first instance will be very expensive, but that was also true of the first heart transplant. The most important thing to do is to generate evidence of whether or not it works, whether or not regenerative medicine in any context is better than the current treatments available. 
The only way we can do that is to ensure that we have robust access to patients, that patients are protected, and that any work that's going on locally, in a European level and globally, is generating evidence for us to understand what works and what works well. Because the advanced therapy medicinal products are so complicated to produce and they're for the benefit of the whole of society, governments themselves can't just initiate the production and delivery of goods to society. They have to really facilitate all the various actors and components across all sectors of society. You've got different actors, different interests, um, all sort of working with one another, but also creating certain positive as well as negative tensions between them. One of the sets of tensions that people will be very familiar with are the ethical issues that arise from the perspective of society's interests in ethical and moral conduct, scientists' interests in understanding nature and what we can do with it, and uh, commercial interests with respect to the delivery of actual products. Regulation is primarily about two things, safety and efficacy. Any new product or device in the market has to show that it's better than what already exists. Regulations, nationally, European and globally, can be very complicated endeavours. In the context of regenerative medicine, there are some very fundamental questions that are not yet being answered. For example, are we regulating products? Are we regulating devices? Those are important questions because there are different regulatory pathways through the landscape. At base, however, the most important issue is the protection of patients who might ultimately receive this kind of product or device. I don't think that the current regulatory landscape is unduly burdensome, actually. The regulatory system as, as developed at the moment is obviously focused on development of pharmaceutical drugs, and so it's not quite aligned, although it's not far off. I think that one would look at, is it relevant to be uh, applying cell therapy, human cells in animal models for testing. And in certain cases that, will, that may not be the case, but often it will be. Equally, I think that where you're developing a therapy where you're taking cells from a patient and then you're putting them back into the same patient, that may look more like a surgical procedure than a, than a medicinal treatment, and so maybe may be regulated in a slightly different way. The issue of hype in regenerative medicine is incredibly important from an ethical perspective. We have to avoid what's been called speculative ethics, and by that we mean imagining Frankenstein futures that are really aren't possible, that are not going to happen. We need to be absolutely crystal clear about what the science is doing and what it can do. This whole field is full of, of um, the potential for manipulation of what is essentially our own human tissue, and we're really caught up with our human identity in that, simply because it has our own genome in it, but also because we're then going to manipulate it, change it, bank it, turn it into a therapy and put it potentially put it back into another human being or eventually into um, the human being from which the original tissue was taken. So these things are all, um, they, they raise questions for us about um, how we feel about human identity and the manipulation of it in this way. Embryonic stem cell work is incredibly contentious on a global level. In Europe, for example, we have a convention called the Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine which prohibits the creation of embryos for stem cell research. Some countries, such as the United Kingdom, however, actually allow that kind of work, which means that the United Kingdom has not signed up to that European Convention. A consequence of that is that other protections are not available within the United Kingdom. When it comes to commercialisation, Europe has taken the decision that any inventions involving embryonic inventions with respect to their industrial commercial use are prohibited. That means that the work is not possible to be patented in a European context. The irony, however, of this is deep. It means that the work will go elsewhere, it means that there will be economic consequences for, for Europe, and also it doesn't mean that the work will not stop, it simply means that patents will not be available in a European context. So if regenerative medicine therapies become widely available and they're very effective, I think it's going to create a big shift in society and also in the economy. I think looking forward, one of the key challenges will be looking at the, how we handle aging population, who will obviously suffer from a number of degenerative diseases. In this area, actually regenerative medicine can do a great deal to help. Parkinson's disease and, and Alzheimer's and dementia alone are, are really uh, big problems in, in our society and they're going to be even bigger problems as, as we live longer. 
those medicines will be expensive and so if we are to meet the burden of a aging population we need to think really more radically about how we deal with holistically with the health of the individual rather than just relying on waiting for that individual to become sick and then dealing with the sickness. So we have to start early, intervene early and keep the patient healthy for longer. So if you can imagine a world where, where these conditions don't exist and these individuals, which are going to number in the millions of people, are, are, are have a very high quality of life, are contributing to society all in, into their 80s and 90s even, you can imagine the, uh, the world that we live in is going to be completely different than what we're, we're dealing with at the moment. We aren't going to be able to, to, to deliver this kind of big science and the kinds of solutions for the medical problems of our time anyway with, without the kind of collaboration and commitment uh, and integration of all of the resources that we've got from big pharma and big profit, if you like, down to um, the patients who are contributing the primary tissue. And everyone has to be comfortable, everyone has to be interested and, and uh, engaged in order for it to happen.